Library are so pleased to host you. In our fifth year, this one looks a little differently. As a result of the current COVID-19 pandemic, we are joining you virtually. But make no mistake, this festival is still packed with various ways of amplifying the voices of Black authors. We are here to expose you to the diversity that exists amongst writers in the Low Country and beyond. During this festival, you will hear from local and nationally known authors, publishing professionals, librarians, and more. Whether you're a writer or you want to learn about new perspectives, there's something here for you. So let's take a look around. We are hosting this festival on AirMeet, and the dashboard is easy to navigate. On the left side of your screen, you'll see the different areas of the festival. The Sessions button is where all the programs will be viewed, including our keynote address on Saturday. You can even set up your own schedule based on the programs you'd like to attend or just show up to any program in progress. During the sessions, you can check out who else is there, chat with other attendees, and submit questions to the speakers. And next is the Lounge, where you can connect with other festival attendees. We've set up different tables of interest. Just take a virtual seat and start a conversation. Below that is the arena, and this is where you can engage directly with our authors and sponsors. Select the booth, take a seat, start to chat. Here you can learn about the works of Black Ink's fe featured authors and learn more about our host and partners, like the Charleston Friends of the Library and more. Also in the arena is the Black Ink Info Desk. This is your home base and will include festival announcements and information, a site map, and more. If you run into any trouble and need assistance, just email us at support at blackinkcharleston.org or use the report feature in the upper right corner of your screen to contact the host. From all of us at Black Ink, we hope you enjoy this year's festival. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Black Ink Book Festival. We are in day two, and it's been already an exciting day yesterday. We're excited to have another day of sessions and networking and chats about amplifying Black voices. So during this session today, Getting to Know You, the author edition, children's middle grade and young adult, we are going to hear from some of our authors. And I'm going to introduce myself quickly. My name is Natalie Hauf, and I am the Deputy Director of Innovation at the Charleston County Public Library, and I sit on the Black Ink Committee. So without further ado, we are going to get started with Ms. Vanessa Womack. Good morning, everyone. So good to be with this audience and so great to meet so many other wonderful authors. My first children's book, which you can probably see the cover in the background, is Emerald Jones, the fashion designer diva. And it is a book geared towards ages 8 to 12. And it's about STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, or STEAM adding the art to that for some of you educators who might be uh, keenly interested in how uh, I kind of merge math and fashion. I will be reading from chapter four of Emerald's book. And it's entitled, Let Me Daydream. Emerald sat in Mrs. Callahan's history classroom pretending to pay attention to the lesson. Lunch period was fast approaching, and she was daydreaming about the spring fashion show that would take place at the school picnic. She pictured her friends wearing studded ribbon jackets with asymmetric hem dresses similar to what the models wore in popular fashion magazines. Mrs. Callahan was standing in the front of the classroom, pointing to several charts about former presidents. Emmy liked her teacher, but thought she needed a fashion makeover. She imagined Mrs. Callahan in a checkered pastel multicolored dress 
with a solid colored jacket that was perfect for both the office and evening, well, church for Mrs. Callahan's case. An elegant coral necklace, matching earrings, and leather pumps would complete the outfit. What is the name of the first president's wife, Emerald? Mrs. Callahan asked while at the did not hear a word Mrs. Callahan had said. Emerald was up late last night sewing and helping Ralphie with his homework. Her eyelids were heavy. George Washington was the first president, Emerald muttered. The class erupted in laughter. The boys made mean faces at Emerald. Germain circled his index finger towards his temple to indicate that Emerald was out of her mind. Jermaine, stop making fun of me. You can't even keep your glasses from falling off your face. Under her breath, she made, she called him an ugly four-eyed monster. She was tired of Jermaine embarrassing her in and out of the classroom. It was just last week in the playground when he had pulled Emerald's braids. Emerald Jones, this is the third time this week you were not paying attention in class. Plus, we do not refer to others with unpleasant or mean names. That is a violation of our school behavior policy. You need to go to the principal's office immediately, Mrs. Callahan said harshly. Before Mrs. Callahan could write a note and the hall pass, the lunch bell rang. Emerald hurried out of the classroom and scurried to the principal's office carrying her sketchbook. Now, I'd like to just show you a picture of Emerald daydreaming. And of course, the boys making fun of her. And that concludes my reading for Emerald Jones, The Fashion Diva. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was wonderful. We appreciate you sharing your work, and we hope to see you in the lounge later. Next, we're going to have Miss Jessica Mack reading from her work. Hello, and thank you so much. Um, the name of my novel is Guardians of Mass and Memory, and it is a fantasy Afrofuturist novel. To give you some context for my reading, my, an, an interesting encounter that I'm going to depict in this reading. As Milena traveled back up to her room, she chastised herself for not getting further with Miriam. Miriam always seemed to worry so much, and Milena didn't want to disappoint her, but she still wanted to go to the abandoned city. Maybe there wasn't anything for Milena there. She just wished that she had a way to know for sure. She wanted to dismiss her thoughts, so Milena ran up the spiral of stairs carved into the tree, past Miriam's room all the way to her room. Her room had the looks of that of an unorganized professor, with books stacked by her lofted bed and everywhere else. Some were in makeshift shelves on the wall, sketch-filled parchment, wooden carvings, and parchment models of little figures were scattered about. She paused to admire the mural that covered her wall, covered in vibrant images of her dreams. She was at her musing again, hoping to find some semblance of an answer to the question of her past. She opened the first book, which had an impressive amount of water damage, leaving dripping images of a city on a few pages, but the forms were so muddy. There was no readable text as it was all incredibly faded. The second book was no better, but it had barely their drafts of what looked like schematics. However, the images were so distorted and faded that Milena could not tell what the schematics were for. 
Staring at all of those books gave way to a building headache, but she wouldn't stop until she got to the last piece of parchment. The sun was on its way to dipping behind the dunes, and once again, she had not found a shred of useful knowledge. Giving in to her exhaustion, she fell back on her bed with limbs splayed out and eyes closed. Maleda briefly winced when she felt one of her books hit the floor with a thump. Well, it'll be okay, Maleda shrugged. It was only when she heard a drumbeat hum through her bones that her eyes sprang open. Shadows were cast across the ceiling against a golden light, and she heard voices echoing around her. It sounded like they were singing a song. Maleda's heartbeat ratcheted, and she looked over the side of her bed to see the source of the light, which was the book that fell to the floor of her bedroom. Maleda abandoned the ladder and jumped from her bed to make sure that the book wasn't on fire. It was upon closer examination with hands in front of squinted eyes that she saw that the book was glowing and the light was coming from a seam that must have split open from the fall. It was almost like the light would not stand to be contained as its brightness grew, but the light dimmed just as quickly as it intensified. Maleda's eyes widened and her arms fell as she looked up to see streams of glowing blue falling from the ceiling like streams of water coming from an invisible and otherworldly source. Caught up in her awe, she was too slow to move as one of the streams of light hit her hand, or rather pooled over her hand like cool water, and continued to fall. The light collected on the floor like puddles after rain, and Maleta scooted back until she felt the wall. Yet she couldn't get away from the sparkling, flowing light as it enveloped her feet and the rest of the floor. Maleda was afraid that her books would be lost forever to the light, but as she scrambled to place them on higher ground, she found that they were perfectly unharmed. The light pooled around her. Hopefully, it was only contained to the room. If it weren't, Miriam would have been banging on her door by then. Maleda found herself drawn towards the waterfall of light, and she approached one in the center of the room. What are you? Maleda inquired. And just as she brushed her fingers over the column, it split open to reveal another blinding light, which sent her tumbling back to clutch a leg of her bed. And after the light, two figures appeared. Their faces and the rest of their bodies were hidden by hooded cloaks. She had to get out of there. And that was my reading. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. And now we are going to hear from Miss Joyce Hansen. And just one second, Ms. Hansen, we cannot hear you. I think you are muted, so. There we go. I is believe that, back. that is. Sorry. That's okay. okay. You just start from. Okay. I'm um, reading from uh, my book, I Thought My Soul Would Rise and Fly, which was one of the books in the Dear America series. Um, my story tells the, uh, I tell the story of Patsy, a 13 year old free girl who to read and write. She stutters when she literacy rest of the who were um, still on the South Carolina North Eight Sixty Friend, I saw Yankees from don't have no horn. not they had tail I thought only this morning I'm leading to the soldiers reach cottages I 
Master and mistress old, but old knows a passageway that separates the kitchen from the house. Master called everyone, including the field hands, to the yard. He stood between the gleaming white columns of the house as he talked to us. The government says I have to pay you wages now. If you remain, your pay will be one-tenth of the cotton crop you bring in, and you can live in your same cabins. Then he looked at James, Cook, and Ruth and said, I will pay you $10 a month and provide food as in the past. He didn't say anything to Nancy or Miriam, much less me, maybe because we are the youngest of the house slaves. One of the soldiers spoke next. had to listen to understand his so Friedman's bureau and work as are accustomed. All field hands must sign a yearly work contract the country sovereignty. Everyone was silent. I counted eighty field hands men and women, and not a one was smiling. Then one of the hands named Douglas spoke. Douglas used to always do chores at special times, like take down the drapes when it was time for cleaning the house for Christmas. He was a boy then, but now he's a thin, handsome young man and works in the fields with his mother and sister. Sir, Douglas said, tell me one thing. Is we free? Then other people started calling out too. The Yankees shushed them. He told us that we are free, but whoever doesn't work and follow the rules will be jailed. He says we are not free to roam about and cause trouble. Then the man everyone calls Brother Solomon because he does the preaching in the arbor on Sunday spoke to the soldier. Sir, we will not stay here lest we get a school for our young ones and land for us to farm for our own selves. Master turned a slow red and mistress stared at Brother Solomon with angry gray eyes. I was surprised to see her look at him that way. She and Master always said he was the best hand they had. Brother Solomon is head man over the field hands and helps the overseer. He also makes sure the gardens and the orchards are taken care of. Master said to Brother Solomon that if they stay, he will give each family five acres of land and a plantation school. The hand smiled and so did I. Imagine a school on Davis Hall Plantation. But one of the elderly women, her hand shaking as she held on to her walking stick, asked what would happen to the old people who can't bring in a crop anymore. She began to cry, and she made me almost cry as well. One of the soldiers spoke before Master answered and told her that elderly people cannot be thrown off farms and plantations. Master has a responsibility to care for them. Then Brother Solomon spoke to the woman. Mother Naomi, we all in this cauldron together. We take care of you. Friend, if I was a brave girl, I would have asked that Yankee whether I would be punished if I limped on upstairs to Master's library and started reading and writing. Master never did say we was free, but I guess we are. I can't wait until we get a school. I'll be the first pupil there. And I just want to say by the end of the story, she stopped saying master and mistress because one of the other characters tells her those are slave, slave names. And she picks, uh, she calls them ma'am and sir. And that's good enough. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that reading and for sharing that insight. We really appreciate hearing that. Next, we will have um, Anthony Kelly. Anthony, whenever you're ready, get started. Hello, everyone. I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I, I will be reading a poem and a little piece I wrote uh, a few days ago. But I would like to point out I do have three novels uh, published, self-published. This one is Jaja. Ja. This is about a slave girl that, uh, uh, from the well, it's not about a slave girl. It's about it starts off with a, a story of a slave girl, but it it uh, 
transpires into a story that goes into 2011. Uh, and it's about removing a curse on the black race. Um, and this is uh, Saving Miss Caroline. This is uh, my second published book, a uh, first published book. And it's about uh, these two best friends, uh, 10 year old uh, Travis Moore and Kenya Robinson. Growing up in South Carolina in 1989, uh, Travis has to uh, do something to uh, help his friend out, Kenya. And this is my last book published. It's called Mech. Uh, and that's about black superheroes in uh, tra traveling through time to save a uh, family out of slavery. A lot about slavery, I'm uh, uh, fascinated by that. But I'll be reading a, a, a short poem and a, uh, a short little piece that I wrote a couple days ago. And I don't mean to bring down the energy, uh, but I felt like it, it had to be said. Uh, this first poem is called uh, The Narcissist. Misery besets me, bespeckled, or rather, through a looking glass, she's watching as the sun sets flame to my crown. It's the tale of every king how through mayhem and peril, trials and tribulations, thy mind is forged by heat. That's the poem. It's it's very short, but that's uh, it just came to me a few days ago, and I thought I, it would be nice to read it. And the uh, the little piece, I think it's uh, just a little short, little er editorial. Um, I don't have a title for it, but uh, here it is. I think it's time for healing. But who am I but a uneducated 44-year-old black man from South Carolina? What well, gives me the authority on the behalf of the American people? All American people. Why should I suggest turning down the noise instead of stoking the flames? These are white people's problems. The confusion amongst the so-called superior. The double standards, the doubling down, the dumbing down of generations. Heck, I saw this coming for years. Just ask my wife. The back and forth, the chickens coming home to roost. Why should I care about a country that enslaved me, killed off the natives, and told our God, and told us our God was pale? Sounds like a spin to me. But hey, not all white people are bad, only the, the enablers. But who are they? And please, let's not forget, there was some flies in that spilled milk of gla uh, that spilled glass of milk that stormed the nation's capital last Wednesday. Who are they? You see, what we have here is a failure to communicate. Our phones tell us how to think. We no longer remember numbers. Can't see what's happening around us. Our lives have been hijacked by devices. And yet, like a festering sore that has too long been covered with gauze, now exposed to air, I think we shall heal. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that and definitely something timely. Um, we appreciate your, your insights and, and your work. Um, and now we are going to try to go to Ms. Um, Seisha Wright. We've been having a few technical difficulties with her connection. So um, we are gonna try to have her if for some reason um, the, the, her uh, live stream goes down, um, I'll come back and we will try to get her video up um, for the uh, festival a little bit later. So Ms. Seisha, are you with us? Yes. We can hear you. Can you hear me? We sure can. Okay, do you think it's better if I keep the camera off or do you want me to put it back on? Why don't we keep it off um, just because um, to ensure that we can be able to hear uh, your reading. Is that okay? That's super fine with me. <laughs> All right. We've got your picture up there so we, we, can, we can see you, <laughs> what you look like. So you take it away. All right. So thanks so much for listening today, guys. I have three children's books that I have written. Um, I'm going to be sharing the first one, Layla Perseveres. Um, my first two books are character building books, and the third book is just a fun book. Matthew, who's in middle school, actually, the for my third. So if you're able to come out there. 
so I'm get started. Layla perseveres. It was only Tuesday, and I'm already frustrated with the amount of schoolwork that she had to do each day. Layla looks around and notices the other students are already finished and are playing on their iPads. She thinks they're self conscious to her my work. Come on. Okay, so um, we're still having the technical issues um, with, with, with Ms. Seisha. So I apologize to everyone. Of course, this is virtual for the first time ever this year. So we are rolling with the punches. We're learning how to get through this. Um, and so we appreciate your patience. We will certainly try again and try to get a recorded video of Ms. Seisha um, posted. Um, and so um, we appreciate everyone being here today. If you would like to continue the conversation with some of the authors, if they um, head over to the lounge and you want to um, meet with them or with some other authors or attendees, feel free. All of our um, sessions are on our YouTube page and streamed live on our Facebook. And we will see you at the next session. Thank you all for uh, taking the time to be with us. Bye-bye. All right, thank you so much for having me on today to do a read aloud. Uh, my name is Seisha Wright. I'm an author of three children's books. The first one is Layla Perseveres. The second one is Malik Choose Generosity. And the third one is Penny's Protest. My first two books were um, character building books. So they build character traits in kids. And the third book was just a fun book that I wrote. And my nephew, who is in middle school, actually did the illustrations for my third book. And that book is only digital. And you can get them all on Amazon. Um, but I'm going to do my read aloud of Layla Perseveres for you guys today. I may not get through all of it. Um, I do have my little baby here with me. So you may hear him in the background as he's playing with his toys. But I'm going to go ahead and get started so that you can hear a little bit of Layla Perseveres. Okay. Um, it was only Tuesday and Layla was already frustrated with the amount of schoolwork that she had to do each day. Layla looks around and notices the other students are already finished and are playing on their iPads. She thinks to herself, I'll just turn my work in and get on my iPad because this is just too difficult. And I know there are some people, adults and kids, who decide that some things are just too hard for them at the time and they go and do something that's, that's fun. <laughs> just then, Byron approaches Layla and asks her if she wants to challenge him on Math Wizards on the iPad. Layla accepts the challenge and leaves her incompleted work at her seat. While playing Math Wizards, Layla gets frustrated and quits in the middle of the game. She accuses Byron of cheating because he was getting all of the answers right. Isn't that something? She gets upset that and thinks he's cheating when she should have been doing her work. During writing time, Layla decided to write about basketball. She loves basketball, but she hates writing. Her teacher, Mr. Lewis, told her to write about something that she loves. Layla thought to herself, Mr. Lewis wants me to write about something I love, but I don't know how to spell a lot of words. She started to write but gave up after she couldn't spell the word dribble. Layla put her head down and began to cry. So Layla is having a very frustrating day so far. She couldn't get her work done her morning work done. She couldn't play the math wizards game. Now she's having trouble with writing. Poor Layla. I can just imagine how she's feeling. So Layla's friend Carla noticed she was crying and asked, Layla, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Layla cried, second grade is just too hard. I want to quit second grade and just stay at home with my dog, Rocky. Make sure I go ahead and make that a little bit. 
Yeah, one second. Once before, but... All right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Carla looked at Layla, looked late. Sorry, Carla looked Layla in the face and said, "Quitting is not an option. You have to ask for help when things get hard." Layla sat up and raised her hand to ask Mr. Lewis for help. What a good friend Carla is. Some of us need friends like Carla in our lives. Friends that will help us and guide us in the right direction. Mr. Lewis came over to Layla and noticed she had not completed her morning work nor her writing again today. Now I wonder what Mr. Lewis is going to say to her. I'm sure that as a teacher, he's going to share some wonderful advice. And if you want to hear more about what Mr. Lewis said and how Layla perseveres, check it out on Amazon or hit me or come join me in the lounge and ask me any questions that you need to about my book, Layla Perseveres. Thank you so much for listening.